Scott and I are both signing this painting and he's signing it very delicate to match mine. I always tend to sign mine so that you really have to look for it. So on the back of every painting or drawing, I always did my name, title, size. Um, and then I also say signed lower right hand, signed lower left hand. The reason why I do that is because years and years ago, um, a painting had sold, I think probably an Insight Gallery, and when the collector got it, they said the painting hadn't been signed. And so I was like, oh no, oh no, because that can be something that can happen. And they shipped it back to me and it had been signed. And I was like, oh damn. <laughs> so from now on, ever since that moment, I always say on the back where it's signed, just so that people can look for it. Because I- I think I made it too close to yours. I can move it over. No, it's fine. Okay. Um, you do space your letters out quite a bit. I do. I do it more than that usually, but since That's yours okay. was close, it I does make look them... like it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's done. That's the thing about signing. We always can second guess it. We can always say it's not yeah. perfect enough. Yeah. But it's all right. It looks like it's one word. Like we've morphed together yeah, into one yeah. alien pod. But this is the painting. So really, the only part of this painting that is mine is the face. That's the original that has left. And then everything else is Scott. He just sort of painted over what I had and made it juicier and more exciting. Well, the face is the main thing. Yeah, Scott says the face is the best what thing. everybody's gonna look at, so it's the most important part. <laughs> and then we have it in this beautiful frame. I thought I'd show you a little stuff that I bought in New York and that I've also ordered on Amazon. Um, I don't know about you, but when you go, uh, when we went, when we were in New York, we went to the Dick Blick on Third Avenue and I was really excited about, um, picking out some pastels and I'm, I'm kind of still a novice at pastel because I, I have to get better about figuring out exactly what colors I need. And my friend, Sarah, that you've seen in earlier videos would say, well, you need a color chart you need to write notes. And I'm like, hmm. I think all of us, we kind of make lots of mistakes over and over and over and over again until finally we get sick and tired of making mistakes. So when I was there, they didn't have a giant um, supply of pastels. They had these sommeliers. And of course, while I was there, I just could not even remember the ones I wanted. So I just got these miscellaneous colors. And it was, but I wish they had had more. I wish they'd had more, some more handmade. And then I just chose these. I was like, I don't know, are these the colors I need? I kind of remembered thinking I wanted this sort of dusty rose, but I don't know. I also ordered this little tool, this color shaper. Um, will I use it? I don't know. It seemed kind of neat. You see how it's like rubbery. So like if you wanted to go in there and instead of using like a needed eraser to, or something to clean up or a brush to clean up pastel, you could use this maybe. So I'll try that. Um, uh, years and years ago, I got this and I cannot remember, it was so long ago if I bought them or if I was given them. But when Pan Pastel first came out and did this first series, so long I mean 12 15 years ago I really don't know so it's like a tower right and it's sort of they screw unscrew and it's a great way to sort of store them but I had them in a drawer and I think I tested them out once or something and then never used them again and then finally I thought I'm gonna try I saw some people using them like you know on YouTube or Instagram and I also ordered some of these little tools so you know, it's kind of a way that you can paint with your pan pastel. Okay, so you know, you put these little spongy things and you kind of dip, 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 and you go do, 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 do. So I'm gonna play with those. I think I might have talked to you guys. I got these like finger cups. These are good. You know, you kind of go over like just the index finger and your thumb on both hands. I also use these. Um, I really need to use um, my gloves more and to need to put that art guard on my fingers. Um, I also bought this stuff, you know, for sponges. Do, 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 paint, paint, paint with these sponges. 
I also, when I was in, um, so originally they came out with just like the basic, you know, like a brown, purple, green, blue, you know, just these basic set of maybe 10 or 12. But now, patent pastel, it's like makeup. You can get everything. And I just, I, I chose these colors. Um, so this is sort of like a purple, it's a dark purple, like a sea green, sea foam green, a strong green yellow, a hot pink, a light pink, and a pretty blue. And I just envisioned myself kind of practicing with this painting a little bit. Um, I just thought I'd show you some of the things that I've been thinking about I'm going to use more. These are the four pieces I will have for the Prix de West this year. I have three pastels and one oil. This is La Belle. It is pastel and watercolor. And this is Desert Wanderer. This is strictly pastel. And this is pastel with charcoal. This is just strict oil, but with different hues of blues and blue-green. Here are the four pieces that Scott will put in the Prix de West this year. The two on the right are oil paintings. This one is a watercolor and acrylic with a custom frame. And this is a little oil portrait done from life. This fifth one is one that Scott and I worked on together and will be in the auction. So five pieces in total. Scott and our neighbor David has been out here for about, I don't know, half hour, 40 minutes trying to get a branch of a tree down. That is the problem with ha having home, home ownership, is that you have to deal with this stuff. So like when storms come and then these big trees, branches, you know, go bad, then the problem is, is that we can't park anything over there. So we have to take this down before we can even park a car. But it's dangerous. I keep thinking I should be out here ready to call, like, or drive somebody to a emergency center. <laughs> oh! <laughs> David, your phone is crazy fun. It is so gorgeous out, and I'm doing yard work. I know they're junk. I think they're just trying to get that grappling hook to kind of open up and catch on to the branch. And it just doesn't want to do it. <gasps> oh, this is so dangerous. Oh no. Uh oh. I don't want to take anyone to the hospital today.
gosh, there's a whole bunch of cyclists. I don't think you can go much farther and I'll be in the street. Today in the mail, I got a box from Carol Arnold. Now, if you saw my last videos from Charleston, Carol was there and she won a big prize and a beautiful painting. And her daughter is kind of a famous baker. Her, she's been on TV and she works at a really famous place in Cape Cod. Sarah Arnold, custom cakes, cookies, baked goods, and desserts. I mean, it's amazing. I think she has a, a great Instagram account. Yep. Um, Instagram is at baking underscore with Sarah underscores. So definitely check her out. She's been on one of those baking shows on like the cooking channel or HGTV or something. Um, and inside were these homemade chocolates. Oh my God, is that beautiful or what? So I'm gonna actually have one right now. And I'm gonna have to thank Carol and Sarah. That is so sweet. Mmm, oh my God, oh my God, so good. Holy cow. This is a painting done by Carol. So lovely. She's been a Putney painter for years, and this is her website and Instagram. Check her out. Yay. Thank you, Kara. I ordered some pastels and pastel pencils from a Royal Talons Rembrandt today because I'm going to be teaching a day pastel class, like a workshop at the Portrait Society coming up in May. And to tell you the truth, I did not know that Royal Talons, or what I just call Rembrandt, because I just say Rembrandt because I use that paint so much, I didn't know that they were the parent company of the Brinzio pastel pencils. So that was a surprise to me. And um, so these were the supply lists that I gave to my students. And I wanted to have the exact same stuff to see what they have. And I have dark colored pastel paper. So it's very exciting. I'm excited to open all these up. Oh, I definitely was getting some more of these darker. Um, I've been really into like the pinks, the cool pinks, purples, and greens together. So yeah, maybe that's what we'll do in the class. This is the 24 set, and I think that is definitely pretty much all you need. As long as you have a black and a white, you can kind of temper or, you know, gray down or cool down or lighten up any color. And the little 24 set of these half sticks are kind of perfect. And then I just supplemented with a few more of those colors, like some of the transitory colors, like maybe a lighter pink, um, you know, version, but. So this is what I'm gonna to bring to the Portrait Society along with the darker color Rembrandt. Today I'm in my studio and I'm going to talk about the fact that I ordered one of these, I'm going to first show you the picture, it's Cradled Birch Painting Panel. I got these from Jerry's. This is American Eagle, um, Easel, American Easel 20 by 20. Now I, they have like deep and they have flat and I would say that this is about maybe seven eighths of an inch. 
maybe it's an inch. It's but it's it's not you know they have deeper ones and they have really really thin ones. So this is a probably a good size one, especially if you want to just hang this right on the wall without wire. Or else, what you would do is like inside here you would put those little eye hooks. Um, those little things that you put the wire through, but put it inside so that it's not on this so that it can lay flat against the wall. And buy those little like circular felted things so that when it lays against the wall, it hits the felted things and not the corner. So um, this is new to me buying these. Sometimes we buy them already, you know, like they already have canvas on them or they already are primed a gray or they're, you know, those other ones that are, um, can't even think of that brand, but you know that gesso board or they already come with like a priming on it. You don't have to do anything. But this is just a natural birch. And I told Scott that I was going to put an oil primer base on it because I'm gonna not put canvas, I'm gonna put an oil primer base. And he said, which made me think, because this is literally, it's raw, it's naked wood. So this stuff is expensive. You know, there's different brands. I have multiple brands. I have Gamblin, I have Windsor Newton, um, and I have Rubeloff and different versions of the different brands. Um, I do like this lead oil. Mixed lead white oil primer ready to apply. It has the teensiest bit of a yellow tint when you, it's not pure white and it can take a long time to dry and you might have to do two or three coats. So just letting you guys know. So what I thought, and I'm shaking it up because I haven't used it for a while. And it's, I hate when you open these and like, it's like the peanut butter that you have to, <laughs> oh my God, I hate that. So I've been kind of shaking it and I put it upside down. So make sure this is tight. Also on my table, I want you to see that I put a, just a, a folded up cardboard box because I'm a messy person and I don't want to get it everywhere else. One thing I thought, I'm going to use this water-based polyurethane. It's a satin, just a water-based polyurethane, just to give it a seal because then my expensive oil primer doesn't have to soak up into this. And then I might have to do an extra layer, which that stuff's a lot more expensive. Okay. I wanted to also show you guys the different ways of applying it. I do like applying it with these like foam rollers. I've showed you these in different videos. It's just, this is like a generic um, four inch foam roller, ideal for cabinets and doors with very smooth finish. You get the different kinds. Some have like different nappiness and this is really very, very smooth, you know, and um, like a makeup sponge almost. So that I'll get an incredibly even, especially for the um, polyurethane. Sometimes people like to put textures on their oil priming or gessoing. You can use these type of different brushes, like a sponge brush, these little cheapy things that you throw out. These other ones you can actually wash. These kind that have like the little bit of hairs. So if you want a little bit of streaking, these sort of synthetic ones that you can clean. So you can use these over and over again. Um, sometimes like, no, I can still use this one, but sometimes after you wash it, maybe you can get three, four uses out of them because they do, you know, it kind of builds up and, and then you can just, I guess, I hate to say it, but throw it out. I hate to say it. These pretty much you can't use over. You have to kind of throw these out. Oh, I hate the waste. All right, so what I'm gonna do is open this. First, I wanna open this. So you get one of those can openers. I wanna see what it looks like in here because it could have separated, even though I've been shaking it and shaking it and shaking it. Oh, it doesn't look too bad. Yay. You know how lots of times when you open these type of things and there's like this much of oil? So, all right. Hey, okay, maybe I, you know, as long as you have the lid really, really strong on the top, you can store these upside down. And I'm gonna say that's a, that would be a really good idea for you. Okay. But first what I'm gonna do is put on the polyurethane and I'm gonna see how much it soaks up. If it soaks up like so fast, well then I know I'm probably gonna have to put two coats on it. So what I'm gonna do is you can literally just sort of pour it out, but then it kind of gets all down the can. And so I'm just gonna dip it in here like that. Okay. And then 
you know, just do an even coat. And don't forget to do the sides since this is also naked. And the good thing about these is so Scott and I have kind of, because shipping is so expensive, I mean, and it's harder and harder and harder to sell paintings, you guys. It's not, you know, I mean, unless you are very subject driven and you do specific subjects, and Scott and I are just not like that. I mean, we're figurative artists primarily, but you know, unless we want to always paint pretty girls holding flowers, it's, you're, if you want to experiment at all as an artist, you're going to go through ups and downs. And, you know, right now we're kind of in an experimental phase. I mean, we still sell here and there, but honest, it's not as many as it was years ago. So, and as you get older, or as your prices get older, you can't just keep putting the same amount of output out there. You have to think about how many people are out there buying paintings at that price. So you do less and less and you just try and make them more interesting or, I mean, we're all trying to figure it out. As artists, we're self-employed and we have to hustle. So I do workshops, I do online stuff, I do mentoring and I love it all. I mean, I absolutely love it all. Um, so anyways, I just wanted to let you know the reason why we're using these kind of cradle boards now and even the canvas ones that are called gallery wrapped where you don't see this you know you can literally hang them up and you can paint the sides so that we don't have to deal with framing if the collector wants a frame then they can choose it and we don't have to like worry about damage we don't have to worry about making a much bigger box or crate when we ship so that is the reason why we're doing this and we're kind of going towards that for the future i'll do this now and i'll come back so I put my first coat on and I mean, it's really just been a few minutes and it's soaked up so much that I might have to put two or three coats on this because of it being naked wood. And I'm actually glad Scott told me that because I can imagine putting that oil primer on here and then it's soaking it up and putting another and it's soaking it up. And so I'm probably gonna put at least two, maybe three. Cause yeah, I mean, it's literally dry already. And it's just been a few minutes, so. Just keeping you updated about this process. I did three coats of the polyurethane and I put it in front of a fan. I don't know if you can hear my fan, but if you guys do any sort of polyurethaneing or gessoing or oil lead priming, in fact, what I'm gonna do is actually get some gloves because because this is actually lead oil ground. You know, this isn't just gesso. Um, open windows, do it in your garage, do it some, get it ventilation, you know, it can smell. So I do have a fan on. Um, so, but it did dry pretty fast, three coats because it just sucked into the oil. Um, I'm gonna see, I wonder if I can use a palette knife. I don't think this is gonna work. I think this is not gonna put out enough. So I'm gonna use this brush so I think that sponge brush is just a little bit too small. So yeah, it dips in here. Okay, I can just dip the brush right in. This is pretty thick. It's definitely a different texture than a uh, acrylic gesso. Acrylic gessos usually are much more thinner. So I can tell this has body to it. I'm gonna put on one and let that dry completely. In fact, probably I won't be able to do the other coat until tomorrow. This stuff should dry pretty smooth. I'll be able to tell after the first coat, um, but I'm pretty sure it should dry pretty smooth. If it does too much texture because of this brush, then I can uh, maybe go over the last one with a roller. But I would use gloves, especially because even if you are really careful, you never know just touching the can. I mean, just like cleaning it up, putting the lid back on. But, um, you could get some of this on you and you don't want that. All right, so I think that this is good for the first coat. 
Um, I'll do the ends at the very end because those don't need as many coats. And I will just um, leave my fan on and then just uh, come back tomorrow and do the second coat. See how the first coat sunk in. Okay, and this is the Rublev Lead Oil Ground. I'm back the next day and it's dry, but what I could feel was because that wood was really naked, and even though I did put three coats of water-based polyurethane on it, um, when I put my hand, there are certain areas. So what I'm taking is, um, it's just a very fine grade, it's a 120 um, sandpaper, so it's pretty fine. And I'm just kind of going over in some of the areas that you feel like a raised, like little tiny dot, you know, like, it's like acne. <laughs> I mean, you can feel it through. Parts of it are smooth, and then parts of it were raised. So it's very, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much just to kind of smooth those out. Yeah, so uh, once I sand it, then obviously I will wipe it away with a cloth to get sure all the dust is off, and then do another coat. I don't necessarily want, I don't need it to be like glass smooth, but I don't want any of those little ridges for sure. Yeah, that's probably good enough. Just to, you know, so now I'm gonna get uh, like a slightly damp cloth and I'm gonna wipe it off and then I'm gonna do another coat. And then I'm gonna have to wait until tomorrow. Um, the reason why I have to wait between my second and third coats is because this stuff does tend to dry slow. And also, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I came to my studio late today, so I won't have time to wait to do another third coat. But that is the update. Looking through old, old sketches, things that you just hold on to, We're gonna have friends over for like a little studio sale. And then just like old, old frames that we've had forever that you know we know we're not gonna use. I was trying to clean up my studio because I think the last time you saw it, it was just full of Scott's stuff. And I mean, I'm slowly getting, kind of breaking down old stretcher bars and figuring out what to do with our bike. And I came across this painting. So this is just done on loose canvas and I did that because when I first started to paint, I saw Richard Schmidt do that. So he would just, you know, he, you know, he just used canvas taped to a board. And then later on, he would kind of stretch things down. Um, and I just happened to see this painting. So this is a painting I did, oh my God, holy cow, years and years and years ago. I mean, I'm gonna say probably I was 23 or four. And every time you were at the palette and chisel, you always sat down looking up. So that's why there's always that slight look of looking up a model. Looking at this now, I think to me, I would say probably her chin might be a little bit big, meaning her jawline. Um, I would definitely work from the eyes down to the nose and then the mouth and then the chin would be last and everything else would be after that. Um, I used to be so slow. So for me, this had to have been maybe a, maybe even a Sunday pose, which was five hours. I was just such a slow, slow painter. Very, very thin, as you can tell. Kind of just putting down, oh, and you see like dust and dirt. Cause this has been stored forever. I mean, can you imagine how long ago that is? So I just happened to see that of mine. And I was noticing some of these really, really old drawings of Scott's. Oh my gosh, I don't even know how old this is, but I think that this is definitely, this is before I knew Scott. So this model name is um, Diane. And this is just on a traditional, you know, that kind of sturdy pastel paper. He's using the smooth side and it's just charcoal, vine charcoal. 
this probably this paper is going to be like 22 by you know whatever that is 28 or 30 and this is definitely how Scott used to draw yeah this was um Diane was the very first figure model I ever saw when I was um 17 16 17 how old was I probably 17 I took a high school class at the Art Institute of Chicago and I was so naive I was so awkward and I remember going into the class and Diane was nude and I literally kind of um freaked out a little bit and then like left and walked down the hall and was like oh my god there's a nude model but she was one of those models that was um just a staple we used a lot at school and um yeah. so yeah so that's a beautiful drawing of Diane and these are some of Scott's quick sketches these are definitely not as old um as school I don't know I mean this is just done on newsprint so this isn't super great meaning you know the newsprint is not acid free definitely very angled you see how he uses a lot of angles instead of rounding things out I remember Scott too, and like you learned that from George Bridgman, like creating that little kind of accent for the elbow or the accent, this little triangle for the ankle bone. Keying in on some of those are like the wrist bone. So this is done in very, very sharp red china marker. I don't know how old this is. You know what? Hmm. This could be pretty old. Maybe that is from Scott School. Oh my God, look at this. So this is a charcoal and it says, Burdick, four hours, Mr. Park's Saturday class. I wonder if this is when Scott was in high school because he took Saturday and I think summers while he was in high school. And that's how he got the scholarship to go to the American Academy. So this is just um, vine charcoal. Let me see. Yeah, it's just on a, kind of, this is more of a thinner paper, a cream. He, he was definitely very, very inspired by, you know, Frazetta and a lot of those type of illustrators and artists, how they would stylize, you know, stylize their, the way they drew or the way they would draw fingers or toes or something. It's interesting that the model is wearing like a loincloth. I'm wondering what else is in here. So these were just probably, I think Scott went and got these from his parents' house. And so I don't know if I've seen all of these. Now this is definitely, how Scott used to do it's a very you can see it's very angled very simple pretty much just using the background as the value so that the light of the face stays light this is definitely a softer vine this is on a dark kind of one of those sage papers Very abstract background, but he used to do a lot of por profiles. So I don't think there's anything on this. Let's see, okay, a lot of empty dark pastel paper. Let's see. I don't know when this is. I mean, I'm gonna say this is probably before I knew Scott, I mean, maybe this was really early for him. I remember in school, they didn't really even want us to do backgrounds. They wanted us to do the contour, which is just like the outline and then shade from that in, which is a very, very classical kind of an academic way. And to me, this is more of a painterly way, you know, having the value of the background be able to make the light of the figure be a value that looks like a hard angle of that face kind of looking i oh my god i see like a white pencil white pencil white pencil on the elbow oh my god it is so funny we joke a lot about how much scott used white pencil 
especially when he was in school. And I mean, that's a technique or design element. I mean, it doesn't make sense actually because the wrist is not, doesn't, isn't made out of metal and doesn't have a shiny, you know, edge like that. But I think people would get excited about white pencil. Let's see. Oh, there's another one. Okay. I wish these were more signed so we would know like exactly. But you know, in school too, the whole point was to try and fit a figure on the paper. So you would do the head measuring method. You know, you would take your pencil and you'd figure out how big the head is and go how many heads down, you know, does it take, how many heads over, and then you would kind of do a very light little grid on your paper so that the point is, is to get the head and the foot in. You saw on a couple of the other ones, Scott just went down to the head and hands, but it was trying to figure out how to place something very simple. I mean, using the tone in the background is very, very painterly also. Yeah. Doesn't look like a very comfortable pose. Let's see if there's any other ones. I love looking at these old ones of his. Now this one definitely looks very illustrative. You can tell when, like, you know, look at the way they did the face, or they, Scott. Oh my god, look at that little bang. You know, just the accentuated eyelashes, kind of allowing some of the line to kind of be dark, and then disappear dark, and then disappear dark. It's like you're just kind of getting to learn how to do that. And so, in the beginning, when you first start to do it, you might overdo it. But it is, you know, the calligraphy of the line about having it be heavy in one area and then lighter, you know, thicker and thinner and all that. And I love the, um, you know, the white pencil there on the calf. <laughs> but no, that's a, that's a beautiful pose. But these are definitely, before I knew Scott, it's like, what a time capsule. So I just thought I would show you those. You know, going through old pieces, you just never know what you're going to see. And, you know, probably you never know if anyone would ever see them again. I mean, we're not going to frame these. So I hope you like them. Thank you so much for watching my YouTube videos. I love it when people write me about them. And I have fun doing them, so I'm so glad that people are enjoying them. Please subscribe and follow me and Scott on our Instagram pages, our website, and also on our patreon.com forward slash Susan Lyon.